Nde wonu. Dalunu. Mama nuo. Afambu chelu chonye melukwe. Today I'll be speaking to you about Igbo women, land ownership and the law. When I was growing up, when I was much younger, I remember a relative coming to the house and discussing several issues with my dad. And in the midst of that, he said to my dad, Biangoke, and makuni, while you that took me aback a bit because, I mean, there were four of us. It was only in retrospect as I was growing up that I realized that what the man meant was that my dad had an only son. And that was what he referred to literally as my dad having one child. Why did he need to buy all the land when he had just the one child? Now, this person spoke with an understanding that Females did not inherit land, particularly not in the village. Our society has changed and continues to change and is becoming increasingly urban. Women are inheriting land, especially through wheels and so on. But there continues to be an abiding resistance to this. It struck me at the time that this relative came to the house, but I didn't really think too deeply about it until Several years later, when I was a little older, and I started hearing about different women um, being forced out of their homes, including their homes in the city, um, from, by, by relatives, by male relatives, especially when they did not have um, male children. These widows were left to fend for themselves left to um, cater to the children that they had while the brothers of the men, the male relatives, took over everything. And I always wondered why that was so. It seemed to me to be a, a really um, big contrast between the way I was known, um, the way I was raised. I was raised to be independent, to be um, to have my own will, to think for myself, to know that I could be anything and everything that I wanted to be. And that has been the foundation of me doing all the things that I've done, becoming a lawyer, um, becoming an academic, a writer, and so on. However, in many ways, it sort of reflects the traditional Igbo society. And I'm reminded even now, as I speak of all the strong women that I grew up with that surrounded me all my life. My mother, strong, vibrant woman. My grandmother, my great aunt, well, to my aunt Bokwacha. I remember these strong women who raised children, raised men, bought land, sold land, and did all the things besides. Sat men down and told them some home truths sometimes. And it struck me that this was a dynamic that wasn't quite open to um, understanding. That they lived in this society that said that women in general couldn't inherit land. When we think about it, I mean, just to be a little bit nuanced about some of the arguments that I'm going to be making in this talk. We understand that Igbo society is a patrilineal one. While everyone is recognized to have worth, some carry the family name forward into other generations. In particular, men are favored in land inheritance for this particular reason, that they are the ones who, in a patrilineal society, carry the name forward. Well, that is, that may be understood. The unfortunate thing is that it filters into a whole range of things. It filters into how we treat women. It filters into our understanding of the standing of a man, understanding of a woman in society. Now, in cases where there were no males in the family, including in pre-colonial societies and in today's society, um, 
generally a daughter might be requested or prevailed upon to stay at home, as we would say in Igbo. In a process that we've, we've, different communities um, refer to by different names. Nhachi, Nrachi, my own community, Noewa. Where that person stays, the lady stays and hopefully eventually gives birth to the favored male children who will carry on the name of the family. In other cases, a woman who has lost her husband could bring in another woman who would then stay and have children um, to carry forward the name. These are some of the dynamics, some of the different ways that society, the Igbo community found to ensure that in one way or another, some male person is carrying on the name of the family. I explore some of these aspects um, in my novel, The Son of the House, so I won't get into a whole lot of it because of the limited time I have for this talk. Um, what this has meant, what all of this has meant to my mind is that women have less power. Beyond that, even for men now living in urban areas, the inheritance of real estate, even outside the village, continues to follow the same patterns. Nowadays, there is much less attachment to some traditions, but this remains an enduring tradition in many Igbo communities. We still deal with cases of women who have lost their property because the male relatives came over and took over everything when their husbands died, leaving them to raise their children with nothing. There are several cases that I continue to deal with where, for example, the males in the family will insist when their father has died without uh, leaving a will, for example, that they have to hold the property in trust inside the country and in some cases outside the country. So it is an attitudinal thing. In fact, in general, in many cases, women are assumed not to be interested. Now, when you think about the economic benefits of real estate, you will know that this has implications for economic empowerment and for women standing in society in general. So it continues to be something that we need to talk about. Let me now turn to the law. I'll take a sort of historical perspective here. Um, so in pre-colonial times, what I've described to you was more or less the case. So a woman was required as the wife to um, stay on after her husband had died if she wished. She could leave and marry somebody else. But if she had no male children, then her male, the male relatives of the man, the brothers and the larger woman could take over the family and could then hopefully, as the tradition intended, take care of the woman and her children. Um, and so that was just the, the basic customary law. Fast forward into when uh, the British colonial masters came. They brought with them their own law, the English law, what we call the received English law. And within that, the customary law was still recognized. And we set up the court system and so on. Let me not go into all of that detail. But in short, within the court system, it was recognized that certain customs that were in place before the coming of the British could continue to subsist so long as they were not repugnant to um, equity, natural justice, and good conscience, or to other public policy. So people began to challenge some of these concepts. In a case called Nizanya no Kabui, a 1963 case, which went all the way up uh, to the Supreme Court, a man died, his wife took over his property and started managing his property. His wife was, uh, had only one child, a daughter named Josephine, um, who eventually also had her own children very um, enterprising woman. She was able to uh, rent up, out some of the house, made some money, um, 
built two huts, rented them out and continued to make money. At some point, she wanted to alienate some of the property. That is, she wanted to sell some of the property. The um, male relatives rejected this. She didn't move forward, but eventually she died and her grandchildren, the children of Josephine, you know, um, continued uh, to push to be able to use this property um, fruitfully and effectively. Um, a case had already been begun. This Nezianya Nakabwe case had been begun by their grandmother and that she died during the pendency of the suit. Basically, the male relatives contended that she had no, um, she had no right to the property. She was just a woman, woman married into the family and therefore she should not be able she, you know, to dispose of the property as she chose, despite being the wither of a man. And it was interesting to me on rereading this case in preparation for this talk, that the lawyer, I mean, at the lower court, it was taken as a given that this property, which belonged to the man and his wife during his lifetime, was family property over which the wife had no rights except as given by the male relatives. It was not even, it wasn't really contended seriously. At the Supreme Court, the, the, the lawyer in the case, you know, sought to really argue that not just that, yes, I, we accept that, you know, she, this widow did not have any rights to this house, but having acquired it over a long period of time by being in possession of it and by the male relatives not raising any issues um, over the course of time, by that acquiescence, and he tried to relied on several legal authorities, by that acquiescence, it basically meant that they had allowed her to gain rights to it. If you think about this case, what strikes you, of course, is just the fact that as a woman, you do not have, as the wife of a man who has died, you do not have the right to his property, except as given to you. Anyway, um, she did not succeed in the case uh, and so on. And if you look at other cases that followed, they followed the same line. If you look at the 1967 case of Woman Ibenene, it was held there that in line with the customary law of the deceased, the customary law of Anambra local, local government at that time, women are not permitted to inherit land from their father. If you look at a Jamaica and a Jamaica 1972 case, it was held there that the widow of a deceased person has no right under Onisha customary law to administer the estate of her late husband, especially where there is an Obala, a first, a first male child of the deceased who was not a minor. It doesn't matter how long they've been married. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that she may have contributed a quarter of her own earnings into whatever property they have, she has no right to be part of the administration of her estate. This was uh, in 1972. Fast forward to 1979, um, we have our constitution, we had our constitution, um, the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1979, and a bill of rights was entrenched in that constitution. And within that bill of rights, you had the right to freedom from discrimination under section 39. The right to freedom from discrimination um, provides basically that everybody has the right to be free from discrimination on several grounds, including the ground of sex or gender, okay? And including the grounds of the circumstances of one's birth. So for example, the fact that you are illegitimate doesn't necessarily mean that you should be discriminated against. The fact that you were born female should, does not mean that you should be discriminated against. That same provision is reflected in the current constitution, the constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999, under section 42. So that is now the law, that all of us, men, women, are entitled not to be discriminated against on the basis of our sex, on the basis of what we are going to be. Some cases have been decided after this uh, constitution. Um, you have Mojibu and Mojibu. 
a 2000 Court of Appeal case um, where this custom of Runghachi and Rechi actually came up. Quite interesting case. Um, the man had only female children and then when he died, his male relatives entered into the property and sought to take over the property. Now the children, the female children had in turn had their own children and so on. Some of these cases take very long, a very long period of time. And they brought action. The, the, the children, the grandchildren of the, of the man in question, they brought action seeking to uh, prevent the relatives of their father and grandfather from taking over, from trespassing um, in, in their property. Um, well, in the course of the argument, you had all kinds of uh, issues that came up. One, one was that um, it, one of the daughters had undergone the process of unhachi, unrachi, unnoihwa, and was required to stay home, but as it turned out, did not have, ended up not having children. And so the contention of the male relatives was that they were entitled to take over because if the one that eventually stayed on, that stayed, had children at home, did not go through that process in, in, in their own, uh, from their own understanding, just decided to have children for herself. Um, the court frowned very seriously at those arguments and more or less held that a female child does not need the performance of Unrachi, Unrachi, Unrachi in order to inherit her deceased father's estate. In that particular case also, the Oliyebe custom was held to be unconstitutional. The Oliyebe custom, as I'm sure many more people listening to will know, is a custom that says that where a, a, a man does not have sons after his die, he, his death, he dies, his, um, his uh, male relatives, his brothers, can come in, they can come in and take over his, his home and his his entire um, property. And so, this is a Newi case. This case was, it was found to be, the court found that this was um, unconstitutional and that it, sh it was completely discriminatory. Uh, both the Noikwa custom, the Uliyekme customs were discriminatory to women and that they were repugnant to equity and natural justice and good conscience. No good policy, really. Um, that case was reaffirmed in the uh, Supreme Court case of Moje Gwani in 2004. After that, we then had another decade, till another case came up to the Supreme Court in 2014. In that case, there were six female children. Um, the widow in question had six female children, and it was held. It was it was this was an Oka case, and again, you know, the male relatives came in, swooping in to take the property because there were no male children. Um, in that case, Justice Ogumbi said, and I quote, "I hasten to add that the custom and practices of Oka people, upon which the appellants have relied, is hereby outrightly condemned in very strong terms." A custom of this nature in the 21st century societal setting will only tend to depict the absence of the relatives of human civilization. It is punitive, uncivilized, and only intended to protect the selfish perpetration of male dominance, which is aimed at suppressing the rights of the women folk in the given society. Very strong words indeed. Another case that was decided in the very same year, Ukeja and Ukeja, is another case in point where, you know, that shows the different dynamics that these discriminatory practices can take. Um, basically, in this case, a, chi a, a, a child who had been born out of wedlock to her father sought to be part of this, the administration of the estate after her father died. Um, there were all kinds of uh, contentions in that case. Some around whether um, around her paternity um, and and so on and so forth but others around whether as a female child as a daughter she was even entitled that in to be part of the administration of her father's estate and 
In that case, the Supreme Court was very trenchant, very specific and explicit about the fact that any um, custom that seeks to um, say that females, whether they're widows or daughters of a family, are not entitled to participate in the estate of their deceased father was unconstitutional. In that case, Rhodes Survivor JSC said this, let me quote, no matter the circumstances of the birth of a female child, such a child is entitled to an inheritance from her late father's estate. Consequently, the Igbo customary law, which entitles a female child from partaking in the sharing of her deceased father's estate, is in breach of section 42 sub 1 and 2 of the constitution a fundamental rights provision guaranteed to every nigerian i guess that is the last word on that in essence what all these recent cases in particular ukeja and ukeja are saying is this that you cannot as a community, as a culture, as a society, decide to discriminate against women on the basis of their gender when it comes to the inheritance of property, whether it is the inheritance of the property of their husbands or the property of their fathers or their mothers, of course. And so that is the last word. What that means is that when this happens, there is a remedy because it is now completely illegal in Nigeria. It is illegal, it is unconstitutional, it is discriminatory. You can succeed in an action. You can, you can engage the services of a lawyer, the services of um, an NGO, an advocate like myself to support you if you will find yourself in that kind of scenario. But I guess that's all good and fine. Um, after Ukeja and Ukeja came out, I, I decided to do a, a, a research project, which is ongoing, and I'm hoping that I'll publish the findings soon. That research project is titled After Ukeja and Ukeja. So basically what it does is look at how that case has and other cases that I've just mentioned have changed things on the ground how has this impacted our understanding as Zibo people as Zibo communities of female um, uh, our understanding of female inheritance of land in Igbo land I've questioned older people I've talked to different um, members of different communities, lawyers, people who work in the areas, uh, gender equality advocates, and so on. And the answer I have received so far is that things haven't changed very much. I think this is rather unacceptable and unfortunate. Things are changing to some degree. In some communities, there is actually more of a recognition of Nwekwa and Nwrech, which as I've mentioned, some cases have declared to be unconstitutional in Nigeria, illegal, discriminatory, okay? And in some communities, they're making more of an effort to show recognition of a widow's rights to live peaceably in the homes that they have made with their husbands. But we're still a long, long way from accepting or even recognizing these legal decisions. Indeed, what I have found for the most part is that many people are not even aware of the decisions. And so it has yet to seep into our consciousness or to change things on the ground. I am hoping that this talk becomes part of the discourse and encourages awareness of these cases and the current status of the law. I'm hoping that this awareness will turn us us as Igbo women, as Igbo people, as Igbo men who are allies to adopt a more progressive stance when it comes to female land ownership, in particular land inheritance, but also 
and every kind of land ownership, whether it's in terms of renting your house or an apartment to a single woman, whether it is in terms of selling land to a, a woman, whether it is, in, it is in terms of recognizing the right, the constitutional right of a widow to maintain her ownership of her late husband's property, whether it is in recognizing that females, whether they're married, single, are entitled to a share in their father's estate, to participate in the administration of their father's estate. I know that we have a long way to go, but I also know that as Igbo people, we are progressive. And I can cite different examples of how we have evolved with the times and how we have always moved in a progressive direction. And I'm hoping that this is one of those instances where we can show that we can still be considered to be people who evolve with the times towards equity and towards justice. Finally, um, let me say that there are many organizations that work in this area. Mine is one of them, the Center for Health Ethics, Law and Development Child, and we support women um, <clears throat> and others that are going through these sorts of situations, providing them with legal assistance and legal aid and getting them all the kinds of assistance that they need to assert their rights, widows, females, and other people that I are uh, interested. There are also several other organizations. So if you ever find yourself in this kind of situation, it is hope that you recognize that the law is on your side and that there is something and there are people out there, there are organizations out there that can help you. Um, with that, I would like to say thank you very much for your time and your attention. Dalo Narine, Nadi